I learned something in the book that I, well, I learned several things in the book, but one that I think we, we decided we might uh, put to the test of the audience. Does anyone know why one would scratch the head of Chairman Mao? I just happen to have here a real fake Chinese hundred yuan banknote. And should you ever be in China and somebody give you a possibly fake one, if you scratch the hair, you will see it is smooth because it's a fake one. But on the real one, it has texture. This is a little trick for telling the difference between the real and the fake one. And actually it's mentioned somewhere in the book. And I'm just telling Roseanne something which she did not know, but I know, I have no, it's not in the book. But apparently, allegedly, if you look through a magnifying glass at the 100 yuan bill, you can see two cats who are praying. And I have checked it and it definitely is two praying cats, so they're absolutely right. And the way my book works is actually made up of separate short stories. Each chapter can be, can be read if you want as a separate short story. And they all have but the characters and their themes which recur and linked in very complicated ways. And um, basically, well, page, page one, billionaire, he dies. He's dead on page one. Final page, we find out how he, how he died, end of like a mystery solved. And all the characters are somehow connected to that billionaire by some d degrees of separation. Um, and actually, there was this frightening statistic that I saw in Forbes, and I would have to verify, but it was something like almost half of the new billionaires in China had committed suicide or died. Mm -hmm. Like, it is actually very dangerous to be a billionaire in China, so. But I just talk to people, I just random, you know, people you talk to in bars or people you talk to sitting next to you on the train or whatever. And, you know, an obvious question is, what do you do? You know, and they'll tell you about your, their job, which might be, so I can remember once being, you know, stuck in Shenyang airport for 24 hours, because, you know, and, um, you know, the person next to me, in fact, had a business um, selling a particular kind of electrical generator in, you know, in China. And I would say, tell me about what it's like selling electrical, engine, electrical generators. And of course, there's a corruption involved. There always is. I mean, just about every... Now, it doesn't mean every single person in China is corrupt, but it means it's out there. It's one of the things that one does. Too many people are buying houses and then just letting them sit there, waiting for them to appreciate and making a ton of money. We don't want people to do that because it's driving up the price of housing and the price of rents. You have all these apartments sitting empty because you don't pay property tax. So in order to main that, maintain that property, there's really no incentive to even rent it out and have wear and tear on your apartment. You just have it and you let it sit and wait till you can sell it. So they said, all right, if you're a married couple, you're only entitled to buy one property in a large city, Beijing or Shanghai, where these property bubbles are particularly cute. Um, so what happens? People say, we don't like that. We're going to get divorced. Mm -hmm. On paper, right? <laughs> we're, still, we're still married, but for official purposes, so mm -hmm. that we can buy another property and invest, it costs six RMB, that's a dollar, a little bit more than a dollar, to get divorced on paper. We go to the marriage bureau, which also doubles as the divorce bureau. It's a very fun place to visit. You have very angry people and very happy people on the same <laughs> building. Uh, I visited a few of those. And yeah, they get divorced for that reason. So there's always a workaround, right? The government can try and try and try, but there's always going to be something going around. A group of people living in an some apartment building, so we hear about this little trip the divorce and they have like a divorce party everybody in the building gets divorced you know a big party and then let's all get divorced and they just they tell their neighbors you know but in china actually that's sort of how it works because there is so much corruption and somebody might you know in a beta china might just knowing about the corruption might say how does that economy ever function mm. how come it doesn't, doesn't collapse but it's not unmitigated corruption it's a corruption within a certain implicit framework a western company agrees to um sell a certain amount of copper to a chinese company and they sign the contract, there's an agreed price, it's all agreed. And then the copper will, will be delivered in about six months' time. Meanwhile, about the day after they sign that contract, the price of copper collapses. So the Chinese company is going to lose about $10 million on the deal. Now, if this was in the West, the Chinese company would just have to say, well, too bad, lost $10 million. But the way it works in China isn't quite like that. They have a different sort of way of thinking about it. So what the Chinese company does is they kidnap the Western company's executive. And they go to the Western company and they say, listen, we'll release your executive if you agree to redo the contract so we split the $10 million loss between us. We lose five million, you lose five million. Fair enough. And some foreigners who just say, I have a rule not to be, I mean, in so far as they can, I have a rule to avoid corruption. If somebody asks for a kickback or a bribe, I just say no. And then I've said, well, does that mean that you have difficulty doing business? And the answer is yes. I mean, it means you won't get lots of contracts. Things are life is harder if, you don't, if you're not willing to be corrupt. But if you are willing to be corrupt, basically you have to be corrupt in the right way, which means through Chinese connections you have to get a Chinese partner, pretty much. In China, we sometimes forget, before you do anything, you have to kind of think, well, what are people going to think of me after I've done it? Because that 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 regard, right, um, from society is also a very, very strong one. When I came to China, 
um, realizing that, I mean, it's very much a shame culture. It's very much, uh, as in very much in the Cultural Revolution, you know, you can see if somebody thinks you, decide, you know, you play, you love Mozart and you live in the Cultural Revolution and people think Mozart is a bad thing. And now you know perfectly well there's nothing whatsoever wrong with loving Mozart. But that's completely irrelevant. If society says loving Mozart is evil, and you are an evil person because you love Mozart, then it'd just be sort of irrelevant to mention the fact that you personally don't agree with that mm. and don't think there's anything wrong in, inside you. Most Chinese people do actually support their government, and they do it instinctively, and they do it because if you were to ask many Americans, what is the worst kind of government you possibly can imagine? They would say it'd be some kind of dictatorship where somebody tells me what to do. Be China. And if you were to say, Chinese, what's the worst possible government you can imagine? They would say it's chaos. China's has a history of competing, you know, in the history of China, and very recently, I mean, with mm. living memory even, China consisted of competing warlords. There was no central government. There was, I mean, we we'll cover it. There was no one power. Like, things were just chaotic. You couldn't get anything done. You couldn't even, I mean, I've read articles in the, you know, why did China fail to develop economically for so many, such a long time? And, and one answer, quite simply, is because of the lack of unity, of the chaos. They didn't even, there wasn't even a currency. If you, I've read accounts of people in the 19th century trying to travel across China. And you'd have one currency in this little region, this little local warlord, and then it would change there, and there'd be some exchange rate between them, which nobody really quite knew what it was. And it became I mean, incredibly difficult. And so people in China want stability. They want to have that government. And if there's greater stability by having you know, the Chinese government sort of listening to conversations or whatever it is, then most people in China would support that. We're very familiar with the Made in China label as China being the factory of the world, where labor is cheap and these things are easy mm -hmm. to pull off. But the truth is the cost of labor and the cost of raw materials are going up and these things are being outsourced to neighboring countries like Vietnam and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And China is in a stressful place. There's a man who comes to Beijing and his plan is to come from a very poor background and he got a small amount of capital and he you know, sets up a business for somebody he gets in the news. And the person he's dealing with is corrupt and basically this you know, migrant now is basically he's bankrupt. He's in Beijing, he's bankrupt, his business plans have failed. So he tries to commit suicide. Fortunately, he doesn't commit suicide, but he tries. And he's rescued. And then some other man finds him there, you know, there he was and says, well, you're obviously, a, you know, the fact you committed suicide shows you're a very sincere man. And I think you're a good prospect to in the business world, and I will lend you some money to start you up in a new business. He does. Mm. Now, that, I don't think that would happen in America. If you saw somebody just try to commit suicide, you might feel charitable. It might, well, I'll give you some money just to, because I feel sorry for you. But you wouldn't say, hmm, I'll, I, think you, I think you'll be a good, 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 good opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> because in China, suicide traditionally has been thought of as having a certain, a certain moral virtue associated with it, unlike in the West, with it's associated with craziness. Um, and also, this may have something to do with, I think, it's actually there's a really big difference between those countries which believe in reincarnation and those which don't. Mm. Now, in China, they half believe, just as people in the West kind of half believe, quarter believe in heaven, tenth believe, in China, they, I'm mean, not everybody actually believes in literally, some people literally believe in reincarnation, just as some people literally believe in heaven in America. Do Chinese really believe that people are reincarnated in many generations and they're destined to love each other? Well, they kind of quarter believe, you know? They can suspend their disbelief anyhow for the purpose of watching, watching television. And, but Chinese do, and on some subconscious level, I think Chinese do believe in reincarnation and people in you know, other cultures, such as India, of course. And I think that does affect how people think about things like suicide, actually. And also perhaps people think about taking very big risks that, that don't work out or sometimes or frequently don't work out. Um, they think, well, next incarnation, you know. Mm. They think, well, things don't work out this incarnation, next one, see how it goes then. You know? One of the things which interested me about women in China was because, and particularly we're talking about the, about the one-child policy. So quite often people, obviously, many, in fact, most Chinese people I met of my age or younger, they have no siblings because of the one-child policy. So they would, but Chinese like having, they, they, like, they like having siblings, so they have honorary siblings. In China, there's very much a tradition of having like honorary children and honorary siblings and so on. And so, for example, two, two girls can become not just best friends, but as it were, honorary sisters. Women in China, because a lot of them are only daughters, they get a lot of uh, financial support from their parents, right? They don't have brothers, so everything goes to them. And when it comes time to go to university, um, all of the resources from the family go to getting them to, you know, become educated. So they find themselves, you know, well-employed in good positions, but all of a sudden they could be working and have this good career in education, but it's time to get married. And we meet these women sort of at a time, they 
they've known each other for a very long time. They're sort of in sync. I think you mentioned they got their first periods within a month of each other. I mean, they're very linked, right? They're not biologically related, but they are very much sisters. And now it's kind of like, well, we've done everything we're supposed to do and now we need to get married. It's time. But should he be Chinese or a foreigner? They listed the advantages of each. Chinese. One, understand your background. Two, you understand his. Three, you can meet his parents. And four, you share common goals. Or foreigner. One, he's enchanted by you. Two, he thinks you're beautiful. If you have any flaws, he's unaware of them. Three, makes bitchy girls jealous of you. What does he see in her? Four, lets you get away with whatever you want. They sat in a fast food restaurant near Chin Men and giggled about it. Should they two-time their imaginary boyfriends, sampling one of each type? But they weren't that kind of girl. No, what made sense was for the two sisters between them to do what neither could alone. Um, they called Lin Lin and Fei Fei. Lin Lin took a sachet of soy sauce and one of ketchup. She held them behind her back, shuffling them to and fro. She stretched out her fists for Fei Fei to choose from. Fei Fei tensed. She felt, which was unusual, envy, though she didn't know what Lin Lin would be getting that she herself would not. A tap on the right fist, it opened. Ketchup. Lin Lin saw a tremble on her sister's lip, a disappointment. You know, she said generously, you can choose your own fate. She opened her other fist now, and Lin Lin reached out and grasped the familiar soy sauce and pressed it like a doll pillow against her cheek. So Lin Lin's destiny was ketchup. The sisters felt they could live with a decision. From here on, they understood their true education would begin. They bought a single order of French fries, sharing it between them, each dipping the fries into her own sauce. In the book, you make it clear that the, 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 the sister who chose soy sauce seemed to have been, I would say she's better off. She was better off. Yeah. Uh, she but had a much less tumultuous day. <laughs> well, she, she, she had a she had an e uh, simpler life, put it that way. But Miss the, the one who chose to date the foreigners had a complicated life, put it that way. You do a really good job of getting into the heads of those characters, which, as you said earlier, that are kind of forgotten. Mm -hmm. The everyday, like the chauffeurs, um, people that just kind of exist in a way that, but, but then again, they live on the fringes of that corruption, right? Because they may, they may be driving around the wife of that very corrupt official. Mm -hmm. And as you illustrate in the book, you know, um, there's one driver for the wife and there's one driver for the husband and those drivers are almost never in the same place. You have one of the drivers sort of lamenting that he never gets to have a cigarette with the other driver because husband and wife are never in the same place. And that says a lot about the nature of love and marriage and relationships in China, which you kind of also see through those two sisters, Fei Fei and Lin Lin, right? It's kind of like when they have ketchup and, and soy sauce, when they're choosing, it's not about romance. This is just, you know, marriage is a duty. This is what we're supposed to do. And so let's set about a very practical way of figuring out what the best option for us is. And you kind of see that form of that way of thinking reflected in the nature of these other characters, right? This this driver who is driving the wife of, of you know, uh, someone very wealthy and just the, the complete disconnect that you see between this very wealthy couple and then the driver and his own wife who obviously don't live in the same degree of luxury but seem to have a much more affectionate relationship and actually do see each other at the end mm -hmm. of the day. So even though it's not explicitly the topic that you're looking at, I think it's important to sort of not overlook that a lot of relationships, especially when you get to those high stress spheres of, you know, the super wealthy in China and perhaps the super corrupt, there are a lot of very mercenary, very transactional relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when this particular character, you know, who has the driver and his wife's driver and they never cross paths, when he comes into a bit of trouble, if I'm remembering correctly, his wife does stand by him. Mm -hmm. It's like she's never by him usually, but it's like, okay, well, you know, our, our, our game is up, we're in trouble. And even though I really don't care much for him as a person or we're not, you know, very close, we're not very affectionate, I am his wife and it is my duty to sort of stay by him in, in, in this time. So, I mean, what does that tell us about, about China? And that, you know, you have these incredibly wealthy people that one might want to envy, and then these completely ordinary ones that get forgotten. Um, but yet, you know, their lives seem to be a little bit more full of emotion and, and affection. I will do a longer reading. Okay. But before I will do that, I will just tell you one with my favorite um, Chinese joke. So I have many Chinese jokes. I, I collect jokes, by the way, from around the world. And I particularly like jokes which are not funny, because if a joke is not funny to me, I mean, not funny to me, that means it was funny to somebody. Somebody thought it was worth repeating. 
And that meant that it, if I'm not finding funny, it's that I'm not, there's something to ponder, something about some cultural difference going on. This is a joke, which I think is funny. So there <laughs> and it's a very ancient Chinese joke. It's about 2,000 years old, right. which I read in some... Well, I can't, I can't, actually, I can't remember why I read it, but I remember it was about 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 <laughs> years ago... I mean, I wasn't around here. But, you know, the, 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 you know. Anyway, so about 2,000 years ago, there was a man walking through China, and he was walking by a Buddhist temple, and he felt the need to pee. He couldn't stop, help himself, and he peed right in front of the Buddhist temple. And he was caught, and he was hauled up before the judge. And the judge fined him. He had to pay a certain gold coin, a certain silver coin, a certain yeah, a certain silver coin. And he didn't have that silver coin, but he had a gold coin which was worth twice as much as the silver coin. <clears throat> so he handed it to the judge and said, "Can I have my change, please?" And the judge said, "Go and pee, go and pee in front of the temple again tomorrow." <laughs> and that joke, I've told it people in China, and they laugh too. I mean, and that joke could be, happen today in China. I mean, that's it could. why it, it could, certainly could happen today in China. And that's why it's... So, and the Chinese, it's really interesting. The Ch- one of the things I love about China is the way the Chinese are really connected to their past. And they don't... And they do actually tell... Not a particular 2,000-year-old joke. They do tell stories. When something happens to a partic- you know, corrupt mayor of a city in China, they'll say, oh, it's just like something that happened in the reign of somebody, or Emperor Chen, or whatever it was. And one of my fans actually contacted me and sent me a photograph from... China, not actually from somewhere else in China. And it was a photograph, of the, not of a gorilla on a bicycle, but of a panda on, a, on an electric bicycle. And said, truth is, you know, you before it happened, you made it up. And then the person says, well, can you write a story about a panda on an electric bicycle? And I said, yes, I can. <laughs> and so that's where she, that, that actually is the origin of this entire story. It came about me trying to make up a story about a panda. You can order, go home and write a story about a panda on an electric bicycle. Anyway, that was the prompt for which is the entire origin of the story. She sells her body to save her mother's life. If they made her the star of a reality show, that would be the tagline. The series would end with a mother's funeral, or else with a wedding. The heroine marries a perfect man, and the mother is magically restored to health. She had asked the doctor about the options. Her mother was having dialysis. A kidney transplant, the doctor said. Well, we could find a peasant to sell his kidney. I don't recommend it. Even if you spent a million yuan on her health care, we can't do miracles. She breathed in and out, holding her smile, as she struts along the catwalk, which is not really a catwalk, just a zone indicated with masking tape on the floor of a loft in a warehouse on the outskirts of Beijing. The dress grips and releases her as she moves. She is 25, which in model years is equivalent to 75 in human years. Mm-hmm. Wu Qing is an independent fashion designer. He goes by just his personal name, as if he had no family, as if like the Monkey King, he was born from a stone. Wu Qing has a new line coming out. He is presenting a single dress to a few select buyers, a teaser. And here she is. Eight buyers on folding chairs leaning forward, big windows with grey clouds beyond. A few wintry coughs. Cameras and phones are banned. Nobody is going to rip off Guo Qing's design and bring a copy to market before the real thing comes out. She concentrates on her task. The audience vanishes, the building itself vanishes, all that exists is herself walking along the strip of wood raised high in the sky. That's it. Applause. The designer shoes her away to the changing room, which is not a real changing room either, just a corner of the loft, screened off with a sheet suspended from a rope. A plastic chair. She left her street clothes and her handbag on it. They're not here now. Somebody, watching presumably, moved her belongings. So inconsiderate, it's like a landlord exploiting the peasants. She hears his voice through the sheet. Give me the dress. I need to show the clients. She strips off the dress. She pushes it over the top of the sheet and it is instantly yanked away. She is alone, naked, apart from her high heels. Like a medical examination, she thinks. The fan heater has stopped. The absence of that noise is eerie. The voices can no longer be heard. She snatches at the sheet, pulling it down. Nobody and nothing is here. The entire loft is empty. She is stranded, all but naked, on the fifth floor of a warehouse. She has no phone, no money. 
She looks out at the low sky, dirty snow on roofs and on the streets. She howls, watching that bastard. Why did he do it? And then, how can be sure? How can he be sure? How can she be sure it was him? A voice, sounding like his, called to her. Perhaps it was one of the buyers imitating Watching's voice. Yes, one of the buyers stole the dress and stole her belongings too, so she can't escape and raise the alarm. The heating is no longer on. The loft will soon get cold. She flicks a light switch to no, to no effect, no electricity. She kicks off her painful shoes. The emptiness of the place is absolute, a desolation. She roams the confines. In one corner, there is a life-size stuffed panda, its face to the wall like a naughty child. On the opposite side, a terracotta warrior. She guesses the space is used for photo shoots. The panda and the warrior, these would be props left behind. The warrior is grimy. It seems to be made of plaster. She holds the panda in her arms, a zip at the back. The panda is actually a costume, she realizes. The paws and heads and head are attached with Velcro. She puts the costume on. In the panda suit, carrying the plaster warrior, she walks down the emergency stairs, all five flights. At the bottom, a fire exit, locked. Using the warrior as a battering ram, she attacks the door. The warrior's head dissolves into shards of plaster and dust, revealing a rusted steel armature within. Harder this time, yelling as if performing a martial art, she smashes the armature into the door and breaks through. An icy gust. She's in a parking lot, slush on the ground, a yellow patch where a dog or pedestrian pissed. She's in an industrial area, area many kilometres from the centre. She can't walk far in her costume, and she can't go home like this. Those noisy, those nosy old biddies in the residence committee, they'd interrogate her before letting her in. She can't go to the police. Then she thinks of one person in the whole of Beijing who might be able and willing to help her. Among the vans and trucks and pickups in the lot, there's an electric bicycle. She gets on it, it starts up. She doesn't know how much juice the battery's got. It will take her as far as it will take her. She heads west. Some honks and stares, but no more than she gets on any normal day. Maybe in some other city, a panda on a bicycle would be a marvel. The traffic would halt and a wide-eyed crowd would shout and snap photos. It would become an excuse for a mini carnival with food vendors and skipping children and a skateboarder performing twisty jumps and men singing a patriotic song in chorus and elderly women waltzing with each other. But Beijing is a blasé. We've seen it all before. She arrives at an old-fashioned house with an arch in front and traditional eaves. Through the window, a desk. Behind it, a man is at a computer, his fingers pouncing on the keyboard like a cat on a mouse. She raps at the glass. Help me, help me, Mr. Kong. I'm so sorry to inconvenience you. The man gets up, waddles over, and, grinning, lets the stranger in. Friend or foe, you're welcome either way. She takes her head and paws off. Ah, my old friend Lung, he says. What an unexpected pleasure. Soon, the panda is on the couch, drinking a gin and tonic and telling her story. The man, short and fat as Buddha, listens intently. He tugs his earlobe from time to time and inhales his gin. Kong is a journalist with a reputation for being a muckraker. She remembers Kong once boasting about having exposed a corrupt politician who sent him death threats. If the bastard meant to kill me, I'd be dead already. He is famous also for his salons. He invites an extraordinary mix of people, artists and writers and political activists, even foreigners sometimes, and of course, a sprinkling of beautiful women. She used to go there every month before her mother became sick. It was an education for her, the nearer she got to attending university. When she comes to the part in her story about being naked in the warehouse, he smiles. She's aware of what he's visualising, and she's aware that he's aware that she's aware. <laughs> at his salons, Kong made passes at her every time. Then make an absurd couple, this dwarfish man and this statuesque woman. She guesses this is part of the attraction for him. 
the princess kisses a toad, but that's a European fairy tale. In Chinese legends, beautiful women are either paragons who end up committing suicide or they're courtesans who bring about the fall of a kingdom. She tells him her theory that one of the buyers stole the dress. He laughs, a slow, deep chuckle. Ah, oh, you're so innocent, Lan, such a sweet, innocent girl. I could have frozen the death in there. I'll tell you what really happened, little Lan. A buyer didn't steal the dress, you did. What are you saying? That's what Guo Ching wants people to believe. He set you up. I don't understand. Guo Ching is going to sell his dress twice. First, to the company he has an official contract with, and second, unofficially, to another company who will produce a pirated version. And when the first company finds out, he'll need somebody to blame. Oh, no, it wasn't me who pirated myself. It was that thieving model, Lun. But surely, why do you think he chose you? Just because everybody knows you're washed up and you've got a sick mother, exactly the kind of model who'll be tempted to steal. What are you saying? You mean, how many years will you spend in jail? She shivers in her warm costume. Kong taps his glass on the table. You have come to the right fellow, little panda. I'll find a way to save your neck. She gulps the gin, a drink whose taste she dislikes, and begins to hope. She has faith in Kong's powers. And what will he expect in return? If sex, she'll have to consent, at least to some degree. What else does she have to offer? There are only certain futures for a model on the brink of retirement. Acting, PR, work, and marriage, ideally. Or darker prospects. Her friend Ying, once she was on the cover of Taiwan Vogue, and now she's the mistress of a Tailing tycoon from Ningbo. Ying said, it's better to have sex with an ugly man. That way there's no confusion. Kong opens the drawer and takes out a bulky professional camera. He explains that he'll take photos of her in panda costume on the bicycle. I'll plant a story in one of the magazines, a short piece, the kind we call a tofu cube, how you were hired to do publicity at the opening of a shopping mall dressed as a panda. And because it was so cold, you wore the panda suit on the way home. We'll need some pics of you in full costume and some with the head off so you can be recognised. I'll change the clock on the camera to give you an alibi. You can't have been the model in the warehouse. You were somewhere else at the time. The camera doesn't lie. He puts on a tall fur hat and a down coat covered with a deep blue material, giving him the air of a Qing Dynasty court official. <laughs> they head out into the cold, and he leads her to a crossroads a short distance away. She poses on the bicycle, many shots from many different angles. This at least she knows how to do. She rides slowly away from Kong and toward him along the street, distantly trailed by several small boys in a mutt. Then back to his place. There's a chest at the bottom of the stairwell where he, where he keeps items left behind by guests at his salons. He burrows in the chest like a badger and tosses out sweatpants and a fisherman's jersey, a pair of sneakers, things she can fit into and look normal enough. She changes in the bathroom. She ceases being a panda. One day, conceivably, she'll think of this adventure with nostalgia. Between outfits, naked, she regards herself in the mirror. If she doesn't look too carefully, her body is still perfect. She returns to the writing room. He phones for a cab. There are words that men say when, when they want you. He offers only his detached smile. Even to the last, she expects that he'll take her in his arms and press his lips on hers. The very idea makes her shudder. But he never does. He pays the driver in advance and sends her away, back toward her dying mother. The radio is on in the cab, a raucous punk beat accompanying visuals of the city. She understands that Kong's satisfaction was in his laughter. He sneered at her weakness, even as he took pity on her. And she knows that things will become harder before they become easier, but she will have the memory of the short, fat man laughing at her. To, to sustain her through the suffering that lies ahead. <laughs>